In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. You know, we Orthodox are a minority in this part of the world, even among Christians, a small minority. And we do some things that to the majority can seem really weird. They come in, they see the icons, they might think they're beautiful, but they think they're weird. And among all the things that they think, would think that we do is weird, I think today is probably the strangest. We're going to sing and we're going to do in action, bowing down before the cross. We already sang that hymn once, they will sing it several more times. Before thy cross we bow down in worship. To those who don't know our faith, this might seem not only strange, but wrong. It might seem even idolatrous that we would fall down before an inanimate piece of wood. But that's how outsiders see it. That's not what we do. When we fall down before the cross of Christ, we fall down and worship the one who was crucified on it. We fall down and worship before the salvation that he accomplished on that cross. And we fall down and worship and honor and submission to the message and the truth that his crucifixion on that cross preaches. But if we're going to understand, even as insiders, what we do, what we do falling down before this piece of a tree, we have to understand very clearly another story. It's a story of another tree, and in fact, it is the first story. We have to go back to the very beginning and understand what happened in the Garden of Eden if we're going to understand what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane and in Golgotha and on the cross. In the book of Genesis, we read of Adam and Eve being created and being placed in that garden that was paradise. It was a place of perfection. It was a place where very little work was done and what work was done was done without struggle. Think about how hard farmers throughout the world work to get water, digging wells and trenches, and sometimes carrying that water in buckets on their backs from rivers and streams. In the Garden of Eden, water came up like a mist out of the ground and it watered everything perfectly. Our most expensive irrigation systems don't even compare. There was beautiful food. Adam and Eve had the companionship not only of each other, but of God. God took walks with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. And there was only one rule. There weren't ten commandments. There was one rule only. And it was that Adam and Eve were not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is where so many misunderstand this story of this tree. I want to make sure we all understand it perfectly. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil wasn't about this kind of knowledge. It wasn't about knowing anything in the way that we think of knowing. It was about knowing in the biblical sense. When Adam knew his wife, they had a connection, they had an intimacy, they had a relationship. And parents, you can go home and explain to your kids if it's time what that means. Adam knew his wife, and they became one. So the knowledge of good and of evil was an intimate knowledge of evil that God didn't want his creation to have. He didn't want them touching it, didn't want them near it. Not because it was a breaking of a rule, but because of something else very important. So the first misunderstanding is that 
the knowledge of evil is a head knowledge, that's the first thing we have to understand correctly. If the second misunderstanding is that this rule was about just following a commandment, we have to read the scriptures carefully. God told them, if you eat of that fruit, you will die. Most people hear that and they misunderstand it. And they say God told them what the rule was and then what he would do to them if they didn't follow the rule. That's not what it says. He said very plainly and simply, eat of it and it will kill you. God told us in the very beginning that sin wasn't just the breaking of a rule. It was the process that brings death. Not even just physical death, eternal death. He told us in the very beginning that the knowledge of evil, the familiarity with evil, the committing of evil, the involvement and even touching of evil is the process of bringing death into our lives. Not as a punishment, just a simple natural consequence. When, of course, Adam and Eve broke that one rule, we hear in the second and third chapter of Genesis that they were banished from the garden. Again, we so misunderstand God. We might think, oh, he was angry, he kicked them out. But you have to read the scriptures even just a little bit carefully to know that's not what happened. Because there was another tree in that garden. There was the tree of life. It was eternal life. And those that would have eaten of that tree would have whatever condition they were in, been in forever. And so God, not in his judgment or condemnation, in his mercy, he sends Adam and Eve out of the garden. In fact, he places a cherubim, like these angels we see with the, with the six wings. This one had a flaming sword that could go in any direction to make sure they couldn't come back into the garden. Why? He didn't want them in their condition of knowing sin, of having sin as part of who they were, and then eating of the tree of life, being stuck in that condition. And so in his love, he banished them from the garden. My brothers and sisters, this is our condition. We could blame Adam and Eve easily enough, but we all know we have continued to sin from their time until now. We continue knowing evil. We continue our contact with it, our committing of it, and being infected by it. And we know very clearly from the scriptures and the teachings of the church, that knowledge is deadly. It's fatal. Our connection with sin is killing us. And so what do we celebrate today? Today we celebrate the salvation from that condition. Having connected ourselves to sin and through that connection condemning ourselves to death and having because of that connection been banished from the paradise of Eden our loving Father sends His Son our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to save us. And how does he do it? He does it by a piece of wood. He does it by the cross. Jesus undo, undoes the curse of the first tree by dying on the wood of this tree, the wood of the cross. And when he does that, he blazes the trail for us as he goes down into death and comes out of it, he blazes the trail for us. This is how St. Basil describes it. In the prayer we're going to hear in just a little bit, sometimes you can't hear the prayer, I want you to hear this important section. Talking about Jesus' salvation, St. Basil says, He lived in this world and gave us commandments of salvation. He released us from the delusions of idolatry and brought us to the knowledge of you, the true God and Father. He procured us for himself as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Having purified us with water, water, he sanctified us with the Holy Spirit. He gave himself as a ransom to death, 
by which we were held captive, having been sold into slavery by sin. He descended into the realm of death through the cross, that he might fill all things with himself. He loosed the pain of death and rose again from the dead on the third day. For it was not possible the author of life should be held by corruption. In this way he made a way to the resurrection of the dead for all flesh. Thus he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the firstborn of the dead, that he might be in all things the first among all. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the message of this day. This is the message of God. This is the message of the church. That we have been invited to follow him. That the one who made himself subject to death by taking on our humanity, our humanity subject to death by not his sin, by ours, He takes that humanity and he goes down into death and being the son of God, death cannot hold him and he makes the way back out of death to life. And then he tells us, come and follow me. All Christians agree that to find salvation we have to follow Christ. What unfortunately does not get taught very often these days is what the scriptures tell us how we do that. And that was today's gospel. Jesus told us, He who would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If we take that just to mean we put a cross around our necks, or even on this day we bow down and kiss a piece of wood, if that's all that it means, then the people who think we're crazy are right but we're not crazy. We don't bow down before just a piece of wood. We bow down up to and in front of the way of our salvation. We bow down before the salvation that was brought by that cross. That's what today's feast is all about. That's what Great Lent is all about. It's not just about going to church more often or not eating this or eating that. It's about all of that teaching us repentance, change, or another word, denying ourselves. Denying ourselves from the way of sin, which leads us to our death. And the good news of today is that Jesus has made a way for us out of that. And then he invites us to follow him by denying ourselves and by taking up our own crosses. Today we celebrate this wonderful salvation, this gift beyond any other gift, that the worst of our enemies, death itself, and all that's associated with it, all the sickness, all the sorrow, all the difficulty, all the struggle, and the sin which fills all of that and brings all of that, Jesus brings us salvation from all of it. But it's not magic. We're not idolaters. We don't bow down before a statue. We bow down before a God and submit ourselves to the way that we commit ourselves and then we follow it. If we bow down and don't follow it, we are crazy and we are wasting our time. We fall down before it and then we follow that path. Today we fall down before his cross. We do that so that we can fall down and then pick up our own crosses. We fall down before his cross in worship and in repentance. And in so doing, we turn from our stubborn, stupid, and sinful ways in order to follow his loving and life-giving way, denying ourselves taking up our crosses and following him him, as he leads us back to paradise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.